Hi, everyone, and welcome back. There we go. Um, today, we are going to talk about, uh, this is seven things to know about Dietland. We're actually going to just look at the first three. Um, I think it might go a little long, so I broke it up into two separate lectures. But you can watch the other lecture right after this, or you can wait until you've read the book and um, then take a look at it. But I think it would be more helpful to watch it before. So, um, last time we looked at an overview of the book Dietland. Um, in it, Plum, whose real name is Alicia, um, is working for a glossy women's beauty magazine. She finds, um, through a series of adventures, um, finds a group called Calliope House, which is a women's sort of commune collective of creative projects um, that are trying to empower women, run by Verena Baptist, whose mother used to be a diet guru. Um, and because of her experiences there, Plum changes. And in the background, we have Jennifer, a vigilante person or group, I don't want to give it away, um, who is trying to um, kind of dole out justice to people who have hurt women. So some of the, the things to know and the themes um, and that in the book. Um, number one, waves of feminism. So when we started the class, this isn't necessarily a feminist class per se, but there are a lot of... Um, themes of feminism in some of the books that we've been reading. And because of that, I talked to you guys about the three major waves of feminism. In fact, some scholars believe that a fourth wave began in, 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 uh, I should check for typos, um, in December of 2012. Um, at that point, a young woman was brutally gang raped in India and subsequently died, which sparked local pro protests and eventually international outrage. Now, there is a similar incident in this book, again, kind of in the background. It's not the main story, but it is something that happened that Plum is aware of and so are the other characters. Um, there we go. A similar incident sparks the Jennifer movement in the novel. And as I said before, in the televised version of the book, the Jennifer storyline is much more pronounced. But in the book, it serves kind of as a global metaphor for Plum's individual journey. So she's going on a journey of um, self-discovery. And at the same time, these things are sort of happening in the world that other people are waking up to. Um, the fourth wave of feminism, I love this picture, even though... Let me zoom in on it here. Um, slut is attacking women for the right to say yes. Friend zone is attacking women for the right to say no. Bitch is attacking women for the right to call you on it. Um, it's a, one of the um, Me Too protests. And I, I just love all three of those signs. I think that that is... Um, sort of puts things together right there for you. <laughs> for you. So... If you haven't watched the thing about the three waves, I would go back and do that. Um, but essentially, the fourth wave kind of continues the mission of the third wave. So looking at diversity, um, extending rights to people um, in other countries, and really has a specific focus on sexuality and body politics. So a lot of the third wave of feminism were things like equal pay for equal work um, and um, and things like of that nature. But specifically, the fourth wave looks at sexuality and body politics and cre critiques cultural norms such as slut shaming, body shaming, um, sexual harassment and rape culture. The movement is also marked by the use of social media as a tool of empowerment and social justice. And I think that this is one of the reasons that this really has become a global um, phenomenon, because prior to the Internet, a lot of countries sort of were 
in relative isolation. I mean, we would get news from people, but the internet really directly connects people um, in various countries. I'm involved in an organization um, for school, and when I go into Zoom meetings, there are people um, in that meeting from Singapore, Israel, Ireland, uh, Scotland, England, Finland, um, I'm missing Australia, New Zealand, France, and a, a few others that I'm forgetting. So the, my point is that it really social media has some negative impacts, but it can be used as a tool of empowerment and social justice. Now, out of this, you get things that could be positive or negative, such as like the so-called cancel culture, where um, in some cases, like with Bill Cosby, he had raped over 50 people and social media was used to um, allow some of those women to have a voice who did not feel like they were empowered to do so before and they were afraid and had been um, thinly threatened. Um, other times, the cancel culture is somebody says something that a few people don't like and suddenly they have, um, you know, somebody on YouTube, for example, loses all their followers. Or someone is... Um, Right now, what's going on with J.K. Rowling is is sort of, there's a lot to it. Um, she made transphobic comments and an essay, um, and then a lot of people are no longer reading her books, calling for her movie to be canceled. Then she tried to kind of write an essay that explained why she felt the way she felt, and that's sort of ongoing. So I'm not, you know, commenting one way or another, but I'm just saying this is how social media has been used as a tool for social justice. But really, this is directly connected to the Women's March in 2017, the Me Too movement, which began around 2015, and that is when our book was written. So our book is, the book was published in the midst, or right, or possibly just before um, all of this going on and really reflects a lot of these cultural sentiments. Um, so here are some of the Me Too protests. This is South Korea, Hong Kong. Um, this is a girl who has, um, had violence done upon her. They are doing protesting. Um, Nigeria, Let's stand to end violence, men and women at that protest. Um, we are Me Too. India, this world belongs to women too. We want to be free. Um, Chile, another women's protest there. So, um, and, and so many more I couldn't even fit on the screen. These are just a few examples, really um, a global push for women's equality, um, places where um, women are not being educated equally, they're not being paid equally, they're not given the same kind of opportunities as men. So these are some of the things that this book is concerned with. Um, this, I think, is a really good example of fourth wave feminism. These are two, um, this is from the, the same year the book came out or just before. Um, and these are um, Get Lit was, I don't know if it's still in LA, but they were um, a program for young teens for um, poetry and I think possibly young girls to be able to express themselves. So this is a poem by these two young ladies that I would like you to hear. Knock, knock. Who's there? Rape joke. Rape joke? Rape joke who? Rape joke who's not fucking funny. Don't worry, we're, we're good, good victims. victims. We won't cry too loud or demand your attention or ask for trigger warnings. 
Men like to use the excuse, boys get raped too, when they hear women talking about their personal experiences. First, boys get raped should be its own sentence. If you're only acknowledging their trauma to silence female survivors, then, then you're, you're a scumbag. scumbag. Second, all the male survivors we know would kick, kick your teeth in for saying that. that. And your friends who aren't survivors can't sympathize with you until they know all the gory details. Please, get your porn somewhere else. And once you do get their sympathy, it sounds Sounds like someone cat called me once, so I totally get it. Someone stepped on my foot last week. It, it was, was a man. man. I, I just, just felt, felt so invaded. invaded. And to the boys who write poems. To raped girls, don't worry. There's good men out good there. The light poet. at the end of such a dark tunnel. They'll hold your hand in court and everything. Thank, Thank God I'll get some thoughtful dick someday. You know those poets will tell you Violets are growing in the shadows under your eyes They're not violets, it's skin I know it's skin, it's good skin It's gonna be skin regardless of what metaphors you attach to it You'll be there when I cry Until my eyes get puffy and red You, you won't, won't be tearing, tearing off my lace panties. panties Because they were expensive And they make me feel like I'm worth something Once, Once you figure out that the only time I deep throat is with a feeding tube at the psych ward You'll be gone And if you do want a healing relationship How do you talk about it when the language is rooting against you? Hey, wanna bang? Screw! Nail me! Everything is so violent! How to flirt with a rape survivor? Approach slowly and cautiously. Do not make any sudden movements or loud noises. Hey, baby, I've got anxiety, depression, PTSD, and crushing sexual insecurity. You want to come back to my place and hold my hair while I vomit? And then there's feminists who feel entitled to our poetry and narratives because... As they say, under the patriarchy, like all women are constantly threatened by rape. What does that make us? Hold on, Belissa. I'm turning into a statistic. Holy pepper spray, Batman. I can only see in binary. The ones look like penises. Quick, Anne, you've got to pull it together for slut walk. walk. Truly, nothing helps rape survivors of all gender, ethnicity, and economic level than rich white girls walking around half naked while collaborating with the police. Because the cops historically are so good at supporting victims and catching rapists, getting real tired of slut walk slogans too. Don't slut shame me. How about do not refer to me as a slut ever. Real men don't rape. Oh shit, must have been a ghost then. Consent is sexy. Lingerie is sexy. Sexy. Consent is a basic human right. You guys are supposed to be the adults we look up to, but we went through our moon goddess phase in seventh grade. Humor helps trauma. We just want to know that you're laughing with us. We can joke about it because it's ours to joke about, similar to how our bruises are ours to poke at and yours to keep away from. Yeah, um, it's a really powerful poem, and I think it shows a little bit of some of the things that um, the fourth wave of feminism has been trying to do to um, make people aware of the culture. And for really the push, um, even in literature especially, is own voices, um, that it's the people who have had these experiences who are talking about them. And um, as these girls point out, as these young women point out, not other people co-opting their story. Um, not uh, a girl whose foot was stepped on. Not a guy who thinks that he's being supportive by describing the violets under her eyes when she's got bruises. Um, not a um, a girl who has an experience this just uh, doing a a walk at a college and thinking that that's going to solve everything. Right. Um, so that's one of the major, um, I think, I don't even want to say themes, but I think really it's more about the setting. That's the setting for this book. These are the things going on in the culture and the, the story really could not take place in any other time period. Not, not, it wouldn't be the same. So, um, yeah, so setting is quite important. Now, one of the actual themes of the book is the male gaze. And to explain this a little bit, feminist theorist Laura Mulvey developed this term in 1975 as an 
feminist offshoot of the sh- theories of Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault, um, he developed some theories about the gays and surveillance and, um, and basically said that people who are looked upon um, have less power than those doing the looking. So if you can imagine the people in a prison um, versus the prison guards or that if places have security cameras that the people behind the scenes watching have more power over those who are being watched. And Laura Mulvey kind of said essentially took this and said well there's a male gaze and and in these terms too not I don't want to exclude anyone but the theories were kind of based on a heterosexual male gaze um, being a dominant way of looking at the world. And it's the act of depicting women in the world in visual arts and in literature from a masculine heterosexual perspective. So a lot of what we're talking about in the novel is has to do from this very typical, um, as the girls in the video just said, the patriarchy, the the heterosexual male perspective, which is interesting because there are um, lesbian characters in the novel um, and Plum herself is heterosexual but almost asexual in a way. But at any rate... Um, this is an example of the male gaze and people were talking about, you know, has this changed? And, uh, this person said, no, (laughs) then versus now, um, it's sort of the same that women are being depicted as sex objects. The gaze presents women as sexual objects who then really only exist for the pleasure of the male viewer. Um, It's particularly true of advertising where women's bodies are cut up to sell products. Here is an example of an advertisement. I think possibly for the shoes, maybe. Um, But this young girl, I think when she did this, she's, she's under the age of 10 for sure. And it was a whole spread of advertisements of girls dressed up like women. When you have this idea of the male gaze and when that's pervasive in culture what basically happens they've found is that women are considered attractive only at a certain age so meaning that their fertile years possibly from you know age 18 to let's say possibly 30 right so what happens is If that's the case, a lot of times young girls are sexualized to make them look older. Older women will then do things to make themselves look younger because they're not considered attractive um, by many, at least. Um, So then you have things like dyeing your hair and having plastic surgery and trying to lose weight and um, getting things like fillers in your lips or cheeks to make you look younger, Um, skin treatments, right? All of those types of things. But this also happens particularly in pornography, um, often depicts images directly from a male perspective in such a way sometimes only the female body can be seen um, or no male faces are visible, um, almost as if it's really being looked at from a a male's perspective. And we won't get too much into this, but there are certain types of pornography that don't involve men at all, which are particularly popular for this exact reason. And it does come up in the book. Now, it's not a major plot line, but I do like to mention it because people can find it jarring, but it is, it's really supposed to be jarring. Um, and it's supposed to be, um, in your face and uncomfortable. And this culture really hurts everyone. So women who are considered beautiful are not valued for anything else. And they're trapped by their own, uh, by these types of beauty standards. Um, they're devalued for their intelligence. Um, and, um, 
and only valued really for their attractive qualities, which again, then when they become older, that becomes problematic. And if you want to watch something about that, Grace and Frankie on Netflix is amazing. It really talks about the female experience of two women who are who were beautiful and who are getting older and how they deal with that and how they fight against some of these um, these cultural um, understandings. On the opposite side, women who are not attractive can be largely ignored, shamed, and even attacked for their looks. And that's really what happens in this book. Um, Plum is shaming herself, but that's a reflection of what society has already um, told her to do and think about herself. And also there are men and women who judge others by this criteria and they're trapped in this system too of being unable to grow or mature. Um, how can you rise up in Maslow's hierarchy of needs to have self-actualization when you treat other people like garbage? Um, when you look at other people like sex objects and nothing more, you can't. Um, so it's really... in. Culturally, it's something that's problematic for everyone. Um, the result of the male gaze. So what do we do then when a woman is not visually appealing according to cultural norms? Um, to some men, a woman, a woman who is unappealing can just be ignored. And I have seen this happen. Um, I have a, a friend who um, got was dating someone and eventually married him. And when he met her other friends, a couple of them, he did not consider attractive. And he sort of went up and down with his eyes to body check them and then turned away and did not even talk to them. Um, and there were only, I think maybe six of us there. So to not talk to two people because you find them un unattractive, um, it's it's part of the and you know again he's part of this culture I don't even think that he would have known that he did that it wasn't something he did consciously I think it was just something that um he looked at them and was like you're not worthy of my time or attention um and these other you know three or four people are um sometimes to to a few people and again not all people but to a few and this is not just men who do this either i've seen women do this as well but um for some per people a woman who is fat or uh seemingly unattractive in some way is so disgusting that she should be abused or ignored um in other words in this view women only exist to be quote unquote fuckable I, I hate to swear here, but this is the term used in the book. Um, fuckability comes up quite a bit, and I want to talk about it here. I really wish this were an in-person class in some ways, but um, it's not. So here we go. Basically, if a woman is not fuckable, she should not exist. So here are some examples of advertising. Um, this is, I'm going to zoom in. So we can actually see, um, this is, I believe right here, what they're advertising links, but you wouldn't know that because the central focus is right there, um, and possibly right there. Um, the pinup pose and doesn't everybody cook in their underwear and high heels? <laughs> it's just, it's a little bit funny to me, but that's a way of, you know, they say sex sells because they're, they're using her body as a marketing tool. Um, this is an even more disturbing ad. It really looks like she's about to be sexually assaulted while several people kind of look on to this happening. Um, the way that she's being pinned down, um, the ad is for Dolce and Gabbana, but the men are there circling the woman. Um, she's the center of things. And this is part of the rape culture that the fourth wave of feminism is trying to change. Um, this is a meme. Hair everywhere different eyebrows, dirt in eye, unexpressive mouth, my dog wears the same cow collar, loose clothing equals fat, two out of ten. Um, 
it's a little bit of a joke, but it started as something um, not a joke. And it just sort of shows the way that even women who are superstars and considered beautiful, um, uneven nostrils. I couldn't find, I wanted to find a picture. Um, Megan Fox is beautiful. And then they find one picture of her thumbs and they, um, and they say, Oh, that's gross. I wouldn't be with her. Right. So the, again, breaking people down because they're not seemingly perfect. Another result of the male gaze, um, I have the same the same text there. Sorry, guys. Um, so the first result of the male gaze is that if a woman is beautiful and she is fuckable, then that's all that we care about. On the opposite end, you have that if they are not, then they shouldn't exist. So this is from Reddit, um, where hope goes to die. Um, <laughs> You're fat and awful. This is somebody responding to the person above. Um, I th triggered. You have shell shock. You spend too much time in the trench. You look like an overstuffed, privileged, sheltered trash bag. How dare you claim such disorder? You possess agency. You never experienced trauma in your life. Biggest worry is having your pizza stolen. So the person above was talking about how um, they had PTSD and that had led to an eating disorder, which then led to them being overweight. And, um, yes, she did. She's a garbage human being. She needs a gulag. That's a Russian privilege. It's weird. Overprivileged millennials pretending to have PTSD as the new fashion. So people mocking this person for trying to tell, whoops, sorry. People mocking this person for trying to tell her story. Um, you're triggered, um, you're a trash bag, you need a gulag, you're a garbage human being, you're overprivileged, you're weird, you're pretending to have PTSD, um, and they really have no idea what this person has been through. I believe, um, if I remember correctly, I took this screenshot just of this, but from the entire thread, that um, it was some kind of a sexual trauma that led them to have PTSD. But no, according to this person, their biggest worry is having their pizza stolen. And it is a small, possibly a small group um, online. But this is, these are um, pervasive opinions that lead to other things. We'll get to that in a moment. So um, this meme I love blind dates. That's why all my dates are blind. Again, mocking her for her size, even though she's not. Um, I think she's a pretty girl. Um, has big boobs. Trade off. As if this person wouldn't be worthy of having a relationship. Um, but she does have big boobs, so I guess that's okay. You can see what I mean, possibly. I hope at least here. Um, looking at people as sexual objects only. And really what that says is you are here for me and therefore you should conform to what I want and you should look the way I want you to look and um, you're not here for yourself. You're not here for anyone else. Um, this objectification is really a type of dehumanization. Um, worse is the violence that comes as a result. So historically, when countries go to war, they have dehumanized the enemy. And I liked this from a different slideshow with a different professor. Um, dehumanization is the psychological process of de demonizing the enemy, making them seem less than human and hence not worthy of humane treatment. This is exactly what we're talking about with people who feel this way about people who are overweight and um, or otherwise in their eyes unattractive. You are demonized. Um, this is your fault. You are to blame. You are not as human as I am. You're not as big, good of a person as I am because of this. And therefore, I'm not going to treat you in a humane, kind way. By making the enemy seem less than human... They are able to attack, take away their human rights, and commit atrocities against them. Um, so, for example, this is a um, political cartoon um, from the 1940s. Material conservation is a 
I'm not going to read that phrase, but the Japanese leader here portrayed as a rat getting caught in a trap um, to encourage people to conserve materials. So basically early recycling in the 1940s that they would conserve materials and and therefore more materials could be used to help with the war effort. Um, but here the the racist depiction of this asian um leader dehumanizes um the entire race and then what did it lead to it led to japanese internment camps in the u.s um it leads you know to the ill treatment um the racist treatment of people of asian descent in our country they were they had their homes and jobs taken away from them. Um, they were put into these work camps. So this is just one historical, for crying out loud, this is just one historical example. Um, and in, in a similar way, dehumanizing women by turning them into sex objects meant only for the pleasure of another allows violence against women to be considered acceptable. And here is, yeah, the two are directly connected. Objectification leads to dehumanization and that leads to violence. It is very easy to be violent against a person that you don't consider a real person. And here is an example. Um, I didn't think of Iraqis as humans, says U.S. soldier who raped 14-year-old girl before killing her and her family. I didn't think of them as humans. Um, and that is not an indictment against the military as a whole. My uh, my husband is a veteran. I, I think that many people in the military are um, doing noble things for our country. But this is one example of someone who um, really dehumanized the enemy in his mind to the extent that he was raping a 14 year old girl. And the book diet land is really focusing on this phenomenon, which is really only starting to be studied. This is from a study in 2019. Um, Many dehumanized people with obesity. And, and here's what it says. Many people, including those who are overweight themselves, view people with obesity as less human or less evolved. So what does that mean for us in the book? It means that when people view those who are overweight, like Plum, who um, is obese and calls herself fat, um, when they do that, they don't treat her with respect they don't treat her with dignity and as we saw in the clip i showed in the last lecture um mocking her um attacking women um besides plum um ignoring plum allowing this woman to really begin to isolate more and more and so the journey she takes with Calliope House really is trying to heal her from dehumanization to become um, a person again and to be to to realize that she has value. But here is one example of this process that she is fighting against. So this is a self-proclaimed relationship expert, Dan Bacon, and I just want to show you um here we go. So here's some of the things. Um, will my ta will my tactics for getting women stop working? The answer is no. And I will give you to explain why. The reason I will give you is a woman's cleavage. Even though women get their tits out on display like that in a way to attract men, it doesn't stop it from working. Um, this this man basically teaches people how to manipulate women to get them into bed um, or sometimes to date them or sometimes to not break up with them. And you can see even here, you know, the objectification of this woman. We don't see all of her. We especially don't even see her face, right? He also published this, um, 10 Reasons Why Men Don't Find Fat Women Attractive, um, to say nothing of men who are overweight, but that's a kind of a whole other thing. Then finally, he got some attention because he published this article here called How to Talk to a Woman Wearing Headphones, basically saying that a woman wearing headphones is trying to ignore the world, but here's how you can harass and hit on her. 
And as this person on Twitter says, I wear my headphones to block out the barrage of catcalling. Leave me be. Don't hit on women hair wearing headphones. And other women kind of responded the same way. Um, I wear headphones because I don't feel safe. And if I am have headphones on, then men know that I'm not paying attention to them. I'm less likely to be harassed. I'm less likely to be attacked. Um, and he responded to that basically by saying, uh, no, I have the right as a man, if I find you attractive to, um, approach you and I'm telling other men how to do the same. He also wrote this, how to get your girlfriend or wife to lose weight. Um, which is, I want to say if you have a partner who is overweight and you're concerned about their health or, um, your relationship, talking to them and having an open, on, honest conversation is one thing. But this guy is talking about basically, um, here are some subtle put downs that you can use so that she feels bad when she's eating or she feels bad about her body so that you can get her body looking the way you want for your pleasure has really nothing to do with this girl or woman actually feeling or getting healthy. It has all to do with um, getting her to look the way you want. And it essentially also, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, ended with, and if she doesn't do that, uh, then move on and find somebody who will. Um, and then that's the type of dehumanization that then leads to this. He answered this reader's email. I choked my girlfriend out of anger and she dumped me. Now, I will say this. He does say in number one, violence is not the answer. But he also says um, violence shouldn't be the answer and it makes a woman feel unsafe. But most women won't do what she should, which is to think, why did he choke me? What was my part of it? Instead, she probably just thinks about you and thinks that you're not unsafe. But you should feel worthy of a relationship with her or other women because every man makes silly mistakes at some point in his life. The greatest of all men make <laughs> learn from their mistakes. Don't put yourself down because of what happened. It was a silly mistake. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And then at the end, once you're ready, contact her, interact with her, reattract her, and guide her back into a relationship. Now, I'm going to tell you that those words are code for manipulate her into going out with you again. So this is what I mean by the idea that objectification leads to dehumanization which then leads to violence. Um, the woman is there for my pleasure and my pleasure alone. Therefore, I have the right to hit her. And if she leaves me because I do that, then I should find a way to manipulate her into getting back with me. Um, there's nothing here about the fact that this person might need to go to counseling. There is nothing here about asking genuinely for forgiveness. There's nothing here to say this was wrong and you should never lay your hands on a woman or a weaker person. Um, you should not be abusive. No, it was a silly mistake and you just messed up a little bit. So just be a better man and, and try to get her back. You can do it. Um, and then that leads to to even worse atrocities like the 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 one we saw just a moment ago. Um, and there's Dan, there's Dan Bacon. All of his I would say 90 percent of the pictures of him online are like this, where you can see him and you can see that he's with an attractive woman, but you cannot see her face. So, again, that is a body that is for his pleasure and um, not even worthy of fully showing to the camera. And it's not just him. I mean, you could say he's a despicable human being, but here is a movie poster and it's the same way. We see the guy's faces and the girl's body and the girl's body is what their eyes are attracted to. And it's directly shown from that male gaze. So Dietland really is attempting to demonstrate this connection between the male gaze and violence. So we see violence against women, um, on a larger scale in the margins of the book as the group Jennifer tries to fight 
um, against crimes against women, doling out justice where the system has failed. But on a more intimate level, Plum is really treated with disgust by both men and women. Particularly, there is a, a kind of a montage scene where she is attempting to go on dates. And I want you to really watch how the different men react to her and how she interacts with them. Um, one of the women at the Calliope House, as I mentioned, wrote the book on fuckability that really explores the concepts of male gaze and body politics, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And um, again, she's kind of a secondary character, but when she is talking, really pay attention to those pages. What was she trying to say? How does she define this term? Um, how does she see it? How did it affect her life? And how is it affecting Plum's life in other ways that she might not realize? Um, the pornography research project, looking at desensitization, um, projecting onto all the walls in one particular room of this house. Um, again, it's meant to be graphic. And it's really, again, showing that when you have this kind of culture with the male gaze, that sex and love are totally divorced from each other. Sex in this book is not talked about in terms of intimacy. Um, and it's really quite backward that you don't have any loving relationships where sex comes out of that as a way for people to express how they feel about each other. It's sort of the intention sex what it's meant for that it's really about um it, it really shows how how far away from that idea society has gotten um and this culture really is the central theme of the book so how are things depicted on the individual level a group level and then a global level how are women empowered to fight back not just with jennifer but in other ways and also how are different characters affected by this male gaze and the resulting culture it creates so kitty who runs the magazine seems like a villain but really might be shamed by her own sexuality unable to fully claim that because she's living in this um, heteronormative uh, male driven society um, and also trying to keep up with with um, beauty styles and trends that she's growing a little bit older for Verena is trying to make a better world for hurting women she's the one who runs Calliope house Verena's mother was really entrapped by a diet of her own creation. And that part of the book to me is fascinating. You could have written an entire book just about Verena's mother and I would have read that too. And Plum who struggles with sex, intimacy, um, personal relationships, and shame. So all of those characters as well as the others I didn't mention, I want you to really think about how this culture affects each one of them. Body politics. So body politics is part of the fourth wave of feminism, as is kind of deconstructing that male gaze. And it's about the political struggle of people to claim control over their own biological, social, and cultural bodily experiences. So things like appearance, health, self-care, um, sexuality, sex, reproduction, Georgina Whalen is a scholar and she wrote seemingly personal issues associated with the body, such as rape, contraception, hair and clothing styles, pregnancy or sexual harassment, were not traditionally seen as political and thus were outside the provenance of political science. But bodies are at the core of the political order as markers of status and power. So. It's interesting, you know, that, that things like rape or sexual harassment weren't seen as political. And yet there were times in our history as a country where um, birth control was tightly regulated and not available. You would have to be married to get it and you would have to, um, you know, prove certain things. At one point, it, different things were illegal um, in various countries. Um Pregnancy and abortion are, are political issues. Um, Health care is a political issue. Sexual harassment is a political issue. And yet there was nothing kind of bringing all of these things together. So there are some things that are, um, again, personal and some things that are 
I'm sorry. My dog is starting to whine at me. I don't know if you can hear that. I hope not. Um, some things that were personal and some things that were more global um, and body politics is really intensely personal and um, and people are starting to look at it as, you know, these are political issues. In a study conducted in 1997, Fredrickson and Roberts argued that sexual objectification of women extended beyond pornography to society generally, which is sort of what we've been talking about. So it's not just porn in porn that women's bodies are prized above their intelligence, creativity, etc. I think it's interesting that this study didn't take place until 1997, but um, they found that there's a standard emphasis on female appearance that causes women to take a third person perspective on their bodies as they examine and critique their bodies as if they're not intimately connected to them. So, um, uh, my butt is big, my thighs are flabby, my um, arms are, I have, what do you call it, chicken arms, or um, there's a pimple there, as opposed to looking at your body as a whole. Do I feel strong today? Do I feel powerful today? Do I feel sick today? <laughs> right? Um, and this is really psychological distance women may feel from their bodies might cause them to dehumanize themselves, which kind of plays into that idea of dehumanization. When that occurs, then people are more likely to commit violence against themselves. Cutting, as we saw in that clip last time, um, self-injury, eating disorders, um, extreme dieting, extreme exercise, um, all of those things because the person feels like I'm not worthy. And if I'm not worthy, then I should do these things. I hate my body. It doesn't do what I want. It doesn't look the way I want. Um, as opposed to having a, a holistic view of yourself, of your body, your mind, and your spirit as kind of being connected. And really, this is quite clear in the book. Um, Plum becomes more and more in tune with herself and her body as the story goes on. She's still concerned possibly about the fat on her body, but she really doesn't is I've, other than this at the beginning of the book, she's, she's fat and she says she's fat and she feels that, but she's really not connected to her body. Um, meaning, you know, she's not, um, she's not able to feel sexual desire. She doesn't really know when she's hungry. She doesn't know how her body feels. There's really no touch involved in her life. So are people giving her hugs and things like this? No. Um, sexually, she's disconnected from herself. Um, at one point, there's a woman who seems like she might be attracted to Plum. And I don't even know if Plum is aware of that attraction. Um, that's how kind of distant she is from her body and her experiences. And really is looking at herself from a third person perspective. Um, Alicia is inside of me. Someday I can be that. I want to be Alicia someday. Well, Alicia is inside of her because her name is Alicia. That's who she is. But she's not claiming that because she doesn't look a certain way. So things to watch for. Um, Plum's disconnection to her body. Jennifer's storyline. Um, what is she trying to change and how are body politics involved with that storyline? Um, how other women relate to their bodies. There are women who are thin in this book and there are women who are average size or whose bodies are not even fully mentioned. How do they relate to their bodies um, in terms of food or in terms of sexuality? Um, what significance is the pornography project? And if you can get past, if you can't, you can skim. I don't mind people skimming that part. It's hard to read. Um, but if you can get past that, what's the significance? How is sex described? Why do you think it's never connected really to love or to true intimacy? And I just like this poem. And I think then we'll, we end. Yep, this is where we'll end. Um, I will choose what enters me, what becomes flesh of my flesh, Without choice, no politics, no ethics lives. I am not your cornfield, not your uranium mind, not your calf for fattening, not your cow for milking. You may not use me as your factory, 
Priests and legislators do not hold shares in my womb or my mind. This is my body. If I give it to you, I want it back. My life is a non-negotiable demand. Marge Piercy. Um, and I know I had some mispronunciations there, but yeah, not a cornfield, something to be plowed, not something a uh, uranium mine um, to be mined for um, what the person wants. Um, not something to fatten up or to slim down. Uh, not a cow for milking. Her breasts are her own, not somebody else's. Not a factory just for somebody else to put something in there to produce something. Um, religion or um, the government doesn't necessarily hold shares in her. This is her body. Um, and that's different than saying that she belongs to God. I just want to make that distinction for people. Um, this is specifically, you know, the leaders don't have a say. And that's really what this book is about, really what it's talking about. Um, in particular, food and weight and how those play a role in body politics. I think even more than sexuality, but those are things that I'd like you to look for. So in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at some of the other themes. These, I really wanted to hit the three biggest points. Um, the setting of the fourth wave of feminism just sort of starting up um, and the male gaze and body politics, dehumanization, all of those things are really interconnected. So next time we're going to look at things like the beauty industry and um, and Plum's character development and we'll, and female friendships and some lighter things. And I will see you then. Thanks, everybody.